last 10,000 years, earthquakes around magnitude 9 have occurred along the length of the Cascadia subduction zone 19 times, about every 526 years. The southern section of the Cascadia subduction zone has seen 19 additional quakes of magnitude 8 or higher. The area that lies along Oregon, the average reoccurrence is every 234 years, with the last major event placed at around 1700, which is 316 years ago. Oregon is a geologic mirror image of northern Japan. In both places, the Pacific Ocean floor is sliding beneath the adjacent continents along giant faults called subduction zones. As the ocean plate and continent plates are sliding past each other, extreme amounts of force are built up as friction, restricting movement. When the amount of force exceeds the friction holding it back, the plates slide past each other, resulting in an earthquake. Depending upon the locality of the subduction zone earthquake, a tsunami may result. There will be many areas affected by the Cascadia earthquake. Keep in mind that there will be many costly and catastrophic damages here in Oregon. I will give you some details and images and numbers as to how severe and realistic this is. Listen carefully as to this hits extremely close to home. The damage caused by a magnitude 9.0 and 6.0 earthquake is quite significant. According to a news article on opv.org, shaking does not last as long and it may only damage poorly built structures. Sometimes a magnitude of 7.0 earthquake may be strong enough to damage and deteriorate earthquake resistant buildings and structures. There is a significant difference in the damage caused by a magnitude 9.0 earthquake than a more common magnitude 6.0 or 7.0 quake. Lasting approximately five minutes or longer, the amount of energy release is about a thousand times greater in a 9.0 magnitude than that of a 7.0. In a U.S. geological survey, powerful quakes like this one would end up leaving, if any, masonry buildings standing, destroy bridges, and toss objects up in the air. Even if the numerical difference between a 6.0 and a 9.0 magnitude earthquake may seem minimal, here is a short video clip to show what major differences in magnitude and size we are talking about. On March 11, 2011, a 9.0 earthquake struck off the coast of Japan. The damage from the earthquake and resulting tsunami was devastating. Seismologists say there's a 37% chance of a magnitude 8 or 9 hitting Oregon in the next 50 years. So how much more powerful is, say, a 9.0 than an 8.0 earthquake? Well, it's a lot more. Let's start small. Imagine that a magnitude 3.9 earthquake is equal to just one grain of sand. Compared to a 9.0, this earthquake could cause minor damage. In comparison, a magnitude 6.0 earthquake would then be about 3,000 grains of sand. A 6.0 hit near Napa Valley, California last summer and injured more than 100 people. In this model, a magnitude 8 earthquake would be nearly 3 million grains of sand or about 18 pounds. The shaking of this earthquake could destroy many buildings and could cause high casualties in populated areas. This is the magnitude 9 earthquake, the one that could hit the Pacific Northwest. That's about 100 million grains of sand, or 570 pounds, and it's about the size of quake that hit Japan in 2011. If that wasn't enough to scare you, Oregon is facing a permanent loss of population in a huge economical decline. According to the Oregon Resilience Plan, Oregon's buildings, transportation networks, utilities, and population are not prepared for an event like this. If this were to occur today, the economic losses that we would be facing would be a minimum of $32 billion, and sadly, thousands of Oregonians would die. As of right now, our buildings and lifelines, such as transportation, telecommunications, 
water and wastewater and energy would be damaged so severely that it would take approximately three months to a year to restore full services in the western valleys. It would take over one year for this to happen in the hardest hit coastal areas inundated by the tsunami. Evidence from past disasters show that many businesses that do not restart after one month without power and resources are doomed to either relocate or even fail. Oregon adopted a statewide building code in 1974 that mandated some seismic resistance for new construction. Before that date, the majority of buildings in Oregon had been designed without any regard to earthquake forces. Later, in 1993, Oregon's building codes were redesigned to accommodate shaking from a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, doubling the forces that were used in prior codes. So what does all of this mean? This means that the majority amount of buildings here in Oregon haven't been designed to nearly resist shaking of a magnitude 9.0 earthquake. In 2007, a statewide seismic needs assessment completed by the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries Oregon's widespread vulnerability is clearly illustrated. Included in this study, public schools were surveyed, and about half of the 2,193 schools surveyed had a high or high or very high potential for collapse. The amount of public buildings, such as police and fire stations, hospitals and emergency operations centers, about a quarter of them conclude the same assessment, high or very high potential for collapse. If any of you drive on a daily basis, listen closely, with the 2,567 highway bridges in the Oregon Department of Transportation, a whopping 982 were built without any seismic consideration and unfortunately, only a total of 409 were built to resist and consider the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. The amount of potential destruction continues to increase. If you think this does not affect you directly, take a look at these numbers. According to the United States Geological Survey, it estimates that about 1,900 businesses employing approximately 15,000 employees are solely located in the inundation zone itself. In addition, there are roughly 10,500 housing units with a population of over 22,000 people. These individuals have the highest exposure and will be less likely to escape these hazardous conditions. Lastly, another factor that would amplify the effects of the Cascadia earthquake is the interdependence on our lifeline systems. The simultaneous damages done to power, natural gas, petroleum lines, roads and bridges, water and sewer systems would occur over the larger parts of three states, Washington, Oregon, and California, which are the closest ones to us. Similar to a domino effect, in order to restore communication services, it would require that electric power be restored as well. In addition, that would require roads and bridges to be repaired and a demand for the deliver delivery of petroleum. If one of your questions is, is there anywhere I could move to or temporarily relocate to? The answer is yes. According to the Oregon Resilience Plan, the closest urban areas that would remain the least damaged would be Spokane, Washington, Boise, Idaho, and Redding, California. Fortunately, if moving and relocation is not an option for you, there are many things you can do as of right now to prepare for this catastrophe. Our public has no idea how bad it can be after a 9.0 Cascadia earthquake and the damage it can cause. So far, Oregon's public has really only seen small target-like earthquakes in epicenters like Kalamath Falls. But studies after studies show solid evidence that a far greater, bigger earthquake is coming, the Cascadia quake. We really don't have to guess what this is going to be like. We can just look back to 2011 earthquake that happened in Japan, and it shows a clear picture of what is likely to happen here. A study put out by the Oregon Resilience Plan in 2013 clearly shows the risk and the damage we are looking at. 1,000 schools destroyed one to two years to restore water and sewer to the coastline, one month to one year to restore water and sewer to the valley, and two to four months to restore police and fire stations in the valley. Also, 27,000 homes destroyed along with that thousand schools, and go ahead and add a thousand bridges in there as well. 
The time it would take to discuss all the areas and all the buildings that are not prepared for the 9.0 earthquake would take an infinite amount of time. Instead, here is an example of how we are not prepared and not doing anything about it. One example comes from the Oregon coastline. The coastline is in particularly interesting because it's a double whammy. It not only has the threat of an earthquake, but also the threat of a tsunami. To also go over all the buildings and infrastructures, even on the coastline, that aren't prepared for this earthquake would also take an infinite amount of time. Instead, let's look at one building in particular, as an example. And that building should hit pretty close to home for everybody. The area is Seaside, Oregon, and the building is a Seaside High School. Seaside, Oregon is, is one of the most dangerous areas to be in during the earthquake. Seaside is essentially hammed in between the ocean and a river. Once again, with Seaside, we really don't have to wonder what this is going to look like. All we have to do is look back at 2011 Japan's earthquake in, a town, in the town of Makashake was a very similar town like Seaside in Japan. And there were people who died because of what they thought was safe ground due to tsunamis that happened into the past was actually not high enough. In fact, they had a building in the town that was a disaster building that was designed to go to as in a disaster and the height of the building, the rooftop was supposed to be a safe elevation. And by the end of the tsunami, the whole building was engulfed in water. In this video clip that we are about to show, you're gonna see a story about a seaside high school district that is in an unsafe place because it's in the tsunami zone. On the other side of the state, Doug Doherty's seaside school district faces a double whammy. We are in probably one of the most dangerous places in Oregon uh, to have schools. But when it came to finding a new home for Seaside's aging schools, Doug ran into a problem. As recently as the 1990s, no one knew how high was high enough to get out of the path of a tsunami. Doug asked Rob Witter, a geologist for the USGS, to find out. Wow, Rob probed right into the hills slow. above Seaside and Cannon Beach, and he found a story in the sand that revealed Oregon's violent past. So that tsunami came in and it crashed through the forest. It carried beach sand with it and it towered above our heads almost two stories. It flooded the entire valley. The evidence came in core after core of soil. The geologic layers Rob saw read like pages in a book. We were able to find sand a thousand years old deposited over a mile from the mouth of Ecola Creek. That's evidence that an ancient tsunami that inundated this valley a thousand years ago, flooded all the way up to this point. I remember <laughs> clearly a um, phone call that basically said, Doug, we're finding things here we had no idea about. For Doug, there was only one thing to do. We need to move our schools at least 80 to 100 feet in elevation to be safe. At that time, a tsunami that big was hard for seaside residents to fathom. But then, Japan happened. I really wanted to take you to this point because you get uh, an overview of the entire Togura Bay and see how much damage that, that tsunami actually uh, brought. Dr. Chris Goldfinger, Jay Wilson, and Allison Perch joined Soshu Mitsunaga on a hill above the remains of the Japanese town of Minami Senriku. Residents knew all about tsunamis. They'd experienced several in the last century. But they thought their schools were safe. Actually, the tsunami reached where we're standing right here. Wow. I'm looking straight down on these cars. They're probably uh, 
70 or 80 feet below us at, at least, maybe a bit more, and then maybe another 10 or 20 feet down to the water surface. If you were at a place like this on the Oregon coast, you'd feel pretty safe. You're on, we're on top of a hill here. We're probably, uh, I'm not sure, maybe 20 to 25 meters above the water uh, right now. But where we stood right here on this berm was underwater. It was over my head right here. And there's a school behind us that was inundated to the first floor. The similarities between seaside and coastal Japan were so close, was, was the geologic right. evidence right. so right. solid, that Doug felt his case for moving seaside schools was a slam dunk. It is a beautiful place to live. It's a beautiful place for people from all over to visit. Unfortunately, it's someday literally going to be a disaster area. Doug's challenge was convincing residents to relocate all four seaside schools to high ground. Price tag, $128 million. We uh, had so much community buy-in from our focus groups. Uh, the survey came back. There is a 70% chance that this will pass. And unfortunately, it did not pass. Doug's plan may have been undermined by simple demographics. Polls showed local support, but only a third of local homes are owner-occupied. Nearly two-thirds are owned by non-residents who may have balked at an increase in property taxes for vacation homes and rentals. I don't know. I'm at a point where uh, we're all very frustrated. We know we need that, this to happen as soon as possible, um, but we don't know what it would take. Today, all but one of Seaside District schools remain within the tsunami zone. So there you have it. Even with all the evidence and all the research backing it up and the complete truth staring people in the face of disasters that can happen, people still decided not to take action and that a price tag was more important than human life. Moreover, more important than young human life. There is nothing we can do to prevent this earthquake from happening. The only thing you can do is prepare yourself for when it does happen. Having an emergency kit that is easily accessible in the home, car, or workplace is one of the best ways to prepare yourself. Some first aid items that the CDC suggests every emergency kit should include are hydrogen peroxide, antibiotic ointment, alcohol swabs, pain relievers, any prescriptions or long-term medications, band-aids, gauze, and adhesive tape. These items will help in the event that there are, are minor injuries that need to be treated. For your home, some items that you should consider to include into your survival kit are heavy-duty tools like an axe and a shovel, rope for tying or towing, small tools such as a screwdriver, pliers, a hammer, and an adjustable wrench, some utility boots and gloves, candles and matches, clothing, a survival knife, a garden hose, a tent, blankets and sleeping bags, a portable radio, a flashlight, extra batteries, a fire extinguisher, food and water for a couple of weeks, toilet paper, and money in the form of coins and bills for when you can't use electronics. These items may be crucial to survival if you are in a situation that your home is completely destroyed and you must survive in outdoor conditions. For your car survival kit, some items to include would be blankets and sleeping bags, food and water, a change of clothes, some money, a fire extinguisher, emergency signal devices such as light sticks, reflectors, or flares, a flashlight, gloves, a map, some rope, a radio, pen and paper, some toilet paper, a whistle, car jumper cables, and duct tape. These items will help if you or other motorists are stuck with their vehicle. 
And finally, the last place to have an emergency kit that most people neglect is the workplace. Items that you would consider for your workplace emergency kit are food and water, a jacket or sweatshirt, utility boots, a flashlight, a radio, any essential medications, a blanket, an extra pair of glasses or contact lenses, an emergency whistle. The chance of you surviving an earthquake increases significantly just by preparing yourself by having emergency kits in the most common places that you are. Your life may be saved by taking the time to invest in these simple items. The American Red Cross also suggests that you get to know the surrounding area you are in. Some questions you can ask yourself in the event of an earthquake are, where are the exits? Are there heavy duty furniture nearby that you can use as cover? Are there any items near you that can fall onto you? Where are the emergency items located? And if you are outside, look around you. See if there are any trees or power lines that could fall over. The question now is, how do we prepare our homes, buildings, and bridges for this massive earthquake? Here are some recommendations from portlandoregon.gov. The skyscrapers in Portland can prepare by installing vibration dampening pen pendulums. These pendulums reduce the amount of sway buildings have in an earthquake. For your home, Bolting the, uh, the wood framework to the foundation can help prevent your house from collapsing. Our top heavy counterweight lift spans, like the Hawthorne Steel and Interstate Bridge, will likely collapse. Having a stock of temporary bridges and retrofit critical routes, like Highway 26 Tunnel, will allow emergency services and supplies get to and from essential areas. How can we prepare when it comes to our utilities? With water, we can prepare by upgrading our water systems to be seismically hardened. Los Angeles Daily News recommend that if you lack of water during the emergency, you can use the water in your hot water tank, pipes, and ice trays. When it comes to electricity, unless you have a generator, we may end up with no power. Instead, the recommendation is to know what to do during this event with major utilities, such as electric and natural gas. Know where your main breakers are located and how to turn off your electric supply. And with gas, know the location of your gas service shutoff valve and know how to shut off your gas supply. Coordinated relief efforts may not begin for at least a week due to damage to roads, bridges, and airports. The Cascadia earthquake is a very real and present threat to the future of the Pacific Northwest. With the essential information of what to expect and how to prepare, as a community, we will overcome the disaster and continue to prosper.